Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. In this episode, I'm going to do a critique of the hypnosis teachings of the late Dave Elman. Dave Elman has been a very influential teacher to students around the world. His teachings have had a, a tremendous influence on a lot of people. He's written one of the, the classics, one of the best sellers uh, in the hypnosis field, his book, Hypnotherapy, which I highly recommend uh, checking out. And he's had quite a bit of influence over physicians who practiced hypnosis um, since he spent at least a decade and a half making his living teaching doctors how to use hypnosis. So Dave Elman really first got mesmerized um, or fascinated by hypnosis as a young kid. He was eight years old and his father was terminally ill with cancer and in a lot of pain and doctors were not able to do anything for him. And this stage hypnotist uh, hypnotized Dave Elman's father and uh, helped him be more or less free of pain from then on and until he died and that that affected Dave Elman profoundly and he started studying hypnosis and playing with hypnosis but didn't initially turn it into a, a career he spent a lot of time working um, in radio uh, in entertainment and then in 1949 if I remember correctly uh, he shifted his attention back to hypnosis and he started teaching physicians how to do hypnosis. And this is rather remarkable because Elman was not a psychologist, he was not a psychiatrist, he was not a medical doctor, but he made his, his living teaching hypnosis to uh, physicians. And um, he, rumor has it that he was a remarkably effective agent of change or hypnotist who in very short time periods were able to help a lot of people get dramatic results. Um, when I was, I'll give an example here. When I was uh, on vacation in South Africa back in uh, 2007, I was in a bookstore. I can spend hours getting lost in books in a bookstore and I usually buy more books than I can reasonably carry. But I found this book, What I Learned After Medical School, by a guy called O.T. Bennett, M.D. And he writes about being introduced to hypnosis. And he, he writes, I'm just going to read a couple of things from the book. I became involved with hypnosis in the mid-1950s mid when I took a course from a man named Dave Elman. I owe a lot to him. It was through hypnosis that I learned much about the effect that the mind has on the body. Dave Elman was an old stage hypnotist, like his father before him. Uh, he had given up his entertainment career and was traveling the country teaching hypnosis to physicians and dentists. Now, here's the interesting part. Dave, and this is citing O.T. Bennett, M.D. Dave Elman was a fantastic clinical hypnotist. And what he may not have known about the theory of hypnosis, he more than made up with his experience and practical knowledge. One evening, I took a friend to class with me. He was a professor of psychology and skilled in hypnosis. After class, I asked my friend what he thought of the course. He said, that old man doesn't know the first thing about the modern theories of hypnosis, but yet he is the best clinical hypnotist I have ever seen in my life. Now remember, this is the 50s. The field has progressed tremendously since then in terms of knowledge about memory and social psychology and cognitive psychology and neuroscience, scans with fMRIs and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, what do you... And one reason I bring that up is that when I see a lot of the people who have been Dave Elman trained, they seem to 
essentially spout the same theories about hypnosis as Dave Ellman did when he was teaching in uh, the 50s and 60s. I believe he died in, uh, in 1967. Um, so let's have a little look at this. Now, I got introduced to Dave Ellman's teachings back in 1998 at a NLP course with Tad James. And he was teaching hypnosis. And he was teaching Erickson, Esther Brooks, and Elman. And I think as a lot of students, I found the Ericksonian stuff extremely confusing and, and hard to really comprehend or, or have any idea on how to apply. And Dave Elman was such a, you know, godsend in that sense. Practical, pragmatic, to the point, took a lot of the voo-voo, you know, out of hypnosis, really straight, simple instructions. And, um, and I think that is a, a great uh, strength of his approach, is the directness and the simplicity and the pragmatism. So I'll, I'll go over some strengths and also point out how I think some of them are, you know, weaknesses simultaneously. So one of the things that Dave Ellman was very known for emphasizing, and, and this was not such a common view at the time, was that El Dave Ellman would say, look, there's really no such thing as a hypnotist. No one can really hypnotize anyone else. All hypnosis is basically self-hypnosis. The so-called hypnotist is a dream pilot who's offering suggestions and, 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 and being a daydream pilot of sorts. But, but it's, it's the activity of the subject that generates the experiences. Now, this in contrast to people like Esther Brooks, for example, who, who, who was basically teaching that, that hypnosis was something that the operator more or less projected onto the, um, onto the subject, right? So, so that very strong emphasis on, look, this is a consensual activity. Uh, the patient or client is essentially hypnotizing himself. You're just a guide or the dream pilot. You know, establish consensus, uh, establish rapport, eliminate fear, and you know, everyone can be hypnotized. Now, of course, that's a very optimistic, uh, stance, which on the one hand is kind of pragmatic and useful because it, it gets you to, to go for it. On the other hand, today we know, we know that it's wrong. It's, it's not true that 100% of people can experience what we refer to as hypnosis. There's so much research showing that tests on that Hypnotizability is a pretty stable trait. We may be able to influence it, you know, a little bit, but it's remarkably stable. So, for example, at Stanford, they've, they've done these tests, retests with like 25 year intervals. And uh, the, the, the results are that hypnotizability is even more stable than IQ when, when you test it after a, a 25 year period. And it's, it's not just people's subjective experiences that are different. With the advent of the fMRI machines, uh, people like David Spiegel have been, able, have been able to take high hypnotizables and low hypnotizables and do hypnosis and put them in the fMRI scanner. And you see markedly different brain activity for the highly hypnotizable than you do for the low hypnotizables, for example. So, so, so some of the things that Spiegel likes to point out, so I'm kind of quoting Spiegel's research here, is that uh, hypnosis reduces activity in the salience network, which is kind of like a context detector, uh, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Now, this, this, this kind of uh, reducing the context sensitivity is really what allows people to get really focused and really absorbed into experiences. 
um, there's a higher functional connectivity between the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of the executive control network, and the insula, which is kind of like a, a mind-body pathway. So more connectivity there allows for more mind-body influence. Um, and, and, and also, there, there's kind of like an inverse uh, functional connectivity between the executive control network and the posterior part of the cingulate cortex, which we often call the default mode network, which is what is activated when we're kind of doing self-referential thinking and we're absorbed into what things mean for us. So, for example, uh, Spiegel has this experiment called believing is seeing, where you take a black and white grid and you have highly hypnotizable subjects hallucinate color. Not only do they report seeing colors, but the areas of the visual cortex involved in color processing in both hemisphere light up in the exact same way than when they see colors uh, ordinarily. You also have the high hypnotizable people taking a, a color grid and negatively hallucinating it so that it's black and white. And they're able to do that as well. And, and you see the exact same regions shut off. When low hypnotizable people do this and they kind of imagine it, of course, they're very clear that they're just kind of imagining it and you don't see the same shifts neurologically in the brain. So, you know, Elman, one of the strengths of his approach too was that he very emphasized what he called waking hypnosis, which you could equate to the placebo, you know, just how effective suggestions can be, especially from a perceived authority figure, and especially from a perceived authority figure when one oneself is vulnerable or confused or looking for direction. This is what we call the placebo effect and the no, 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 nocebo effect, right? So, so, so Elvin was very good in his teachings to use waking hypnosis or to kind of set up the placebo effect. And he has a lot of great examples of this when working with kids, for example, in his book in terms of, you know, giving them shots and blood work and stuff like that and getting them to not, not feel pain by, by just focusing their attention on something, essentially by having them visualize something or listen for something and then offering the suggestion that as, as long as you hear that or see that, nothing's going to bother you here. And, you know, that, that, that would be like a typical waking hypnosis suggestion. Now, but here's the thing. The, the, the fact that someone may respond well to a waking hypnosis suggestion, and of course not everyone's going to do that, uh, the, the, the placebo effect is very often like 33, 35, 36% of the time kind of effective. Um, it, it, it seems as if today that what we call hypnosis, at least with someone who's highly hypnotizable, for example, in pain reduction, operates through different neurological circuitry than the placebo effect. So, for example, when when doing when working with pain control, the placebo and hypnosis are often equally effective, and the placebo is sometimes more effective. But with the high hypnotizability groups, hypnotic interventions are more effective than placebo. So, e even though the the outcome might be the same. There seems to be different circuitry, uh, different mechanisms involved in producing uh, the effects. So, so that that's that's one thing too. It's kind of like what do we call hypnosis? What what do we not call hypnosis? Right. Um, but another strength I like of his approach is his induction. He has this classic, uh, it's called the Dave Elman induction. Again, you can buy his books. There's CDs to be found. You, you, you can 
see plenty of people demonstrating it uh, online. Mike Mandel, for example, has a video where he demonstrates the day of element induction. I think it's a... I remember when learning it, you know, ha having this very specific thing to do, as in do this, do this, do this. I, I think it's also like a great training wheel exercise that, that teaches you how to calibrate. Because when you do it, for example, the, the fractionation, the opening and closing of the eyes, for highly hypnotizable people, when you do this, you can very often kind of see the eyes roll back into their heads so that you only see the sclera, for example. You, you might see the fluttering, you, you might see the kind of tearing. Um, within that day of element induction, there, there, there's a lot of things you can kind of scan for and see if someone's responding to your suggestions. Um, the, uh, the, the final piece where you have them, you know, let go of the numbers, make their minds so relaxed that you know, the, the, the numbers are all gone. Um, that, that's a really good one too. Although I should say this, Dave Ellman trained folks have a tendency to, if, if they can offer that suggestion that there's mental relaxation, I'm gonna have you count out loud from 100 and backwards. And when you reach a number 98 or even sooner, you'll be so relaxed that the rest of the numbers will just not be there, right? Um, people might, you know, say yes, I've, I've let go of the numbers, right? Um, and a lot of the element trained people will then go, oh yeah, that's somnambulism. That, that means that they're in this somnambulistic state where you can pretty much, you know, suggest anything as long as it's acceptable to the client and the client will realize it but what i've discovered by playing with this is that it's not necessarily the case at all you can you can go for some other hypnotic phenomena and not necessarily get it you the, the person might say yeah i've released i've let go of the numbers but if you then sometimes, for example, try to go for a genuine amnesia, where you might suggest, for example, that the number four is gone, and, you know, and the, the whole objective there is to get them to say one, two, three, five, right, when, when they count your fingers, you may still necessarily not get that. And um, this... This idea of, 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 you know, you have somnambulism and now you can pretty much suggest anything as long as it's acceptable. This is also something of a myth. You know, people have different talents. They have different capacities. For, for some people, you, you might get a strong amnesia, but they're not going to hallucinate anything. For other people, they might easily get the hallucinations, but they're not going to get the amnesia. So, so this... If, if you use that as a criteria, I think you can, you can very easily, very easily fool yourself. Now, of course, I don't use Dave Ellman inductions anymore. I, I don't promote the idea of somnambulism or a specific hypnotic state. And one main reason why I do that is because if you do formal hypnosis with someone and, and you kind of do these tests to see if you have somnambulism, even if people pass them, they're likely going to be spending time wondering if they're really hypnotized or not versus just engaging with the suggestions. And that's really all you're wanting them to do. You're wanting them to engage with the suggestions. So, so ultimately, I've found that doing formal inductions and selling people this idea of a, a somnambulistic state, uh, the, the, the juice is not worth the squeeze. My, my work got a lot easier, you know, when I stopped doing those things. Um, Elman seemed to get really, really good. Now, before I say that, you know, for those who use hypnotic phenomena and do kind of classic hypnosis work, it's been well demonstrated that people can generate all these sorts of phenomena 
without any inductions at all, as long as they have the capacity to do it. But there is, there is some research showing that when people do these formal inductions, they have a tendency to perform a little bit better. And of course, I think initially, it's really smart to learn something like the day of element induction and to just have an induction and to learn how to calibrate. But, but ultimately, you want to stop doing these types of artificial formal inductions and just learn, just utilize whatever the person brings you to kind of absorb their attention and help them lock in new perspectives or, or uh, reorganize their experience. So it's good like as a training wheel, but, but don't, don't get stuck there. Uh, Elman's big thing was hypnoanalysis. Now, of course, like many people uh, in the 50s, he, he was obviously deeply influenced by Freud and psychodynamic thought. You know, he had this idea of, of a root cause that was lurking in a subconscious mind that you, you could find in a special hypnotic state called somnambulism. Now, all of this is, of course, nonsense, right? But that doesn't mean that he didn't get really great results doing it. And I know that because I've done the same thing myself. I, I was a regression artist for a decade, heavily influenced by people like Elman and Jill Boyne and Steve Parkhill and Jerry Kine and, you know, uh, Randall Churchill and John Watkins studied all these people. I, I, I did this stuff for a long, long, long time. So, so I know that you can get great results through both hypnoanalysis and, and, and affect bridge regression work, and you can get great results. The only thing is that you're not getting the great results for the reasons that these folks are telling you, because their, their theories are all wrong. Now, you, you might go, well, what's the problem with that as long as it works? Well, you know, one problem is that you're kind of imposing a lot of wacky ideas that you don't need to be imposing. And you, you, you can most often get the results more efficiently and more easily without doing those things. So, for example, Elman, again, presupposed this entity-like subconscious mind that, that would store memories and that you could retrieve these kind of repressed or, or hidden memories, you know, through hypnosis. I, I've made videos about this before, so I'm not going to go into this in a lengthy way, but, but the, the memory research today is very clear that memory just doesn't work that way. It's not like an old film strip or an old... VHS cassette, which is stored and which you can then kind of like retrieve in an accurate way. Memory is a creative reconstructive process where your mood, your expectations, the context that you're in, other things you've experienced, things you've read, uh, all sorts of all sorts of social and contextual factors go into how we might reconstruct something. So what would appear as a root cause one day, something entirely different might appear a week later and you might still get the results, right? Neither is, of course, there are unconscious processing, but there, there's no entity like unconscious mind there either, you know. Um, that, that you can communicate with as an entity. And, you know, th there used to be this belief that we could access the so-called unconscious mind and that we could have introspective access to our mental processes. But we can't, you know. Uh, cognitive psychology these days, it, it's pretty clear that you can't. I highly recommend reading up on someone like, uh, like Richard Nisbet try any of his books. He writes a lot about this and he writes well about it. C consider perception. So let's say that you're resting on the grass in the park on a hot summer day and you open your eyes and you see a sun, you see a blue sky, you see all these shapes. 
Um, that's the end result of a bunch of invisible processes that you can't see and have no access to. So for example, the color red, the color blue is constructed by your mind. It's not actually out there. All we see is the end result of all these interactive processes. We have zero introspective access to the processes that the color blue or the various shapes and forms emerge out of. And, and it, it's the exact same with our cognitions and our emotional life as well. We, we have no access to these processes. Hypnosis doesn't change that. So what's likely changing is that the person gets a new theory. They get a new story. They get a new narrative. And when people get a new story, a new narrative, or a new theory, or a new sets of rules, they have a shift in perspective. And they have a different response. So, and, and if someone also has you know, good hypnotic capacity, they can get absorbed into suggested experiences and really focus in on that. And, and they have good connectivity between their executive network and, and, and their insula, you know, they, they can really have these embodied shifts in perspective where the, the new story or narrative or shift in perspective dramatically influences the physiology. That's a way more plausible explanation for what's going on. Not that you're actually discovering a so-called cause. Of course, another huge limitation in regression work is, of course, you're not regressing. You're reconstructing in the present moment. You're not reliving a past. The, the, what you call the past is present as a bunch of learnings, a bunch of stories, a bunch of beliefs. And if you change those, you change your experience. That's what you're changing. So Elman, of course, being a product of his time, focused a lot about the content of we need to figure out the cause, as in what happened to you, who did what. But that, that's not really it. It's your stories. It's your cognitions. It's your emotions and how you relate to them. That's what you're changing, right? You can, you can change that and work with that without having to do these archaeological digs at all. So that's, that's one weakness in, in that particular approach. Um, Elman, so, so you know, the, the, the thing here is that I think people like Jill Boyne and Elman, even though Elman only teached physicians, you know, Gil Boyne trained more lay people. I think both of them have had an, an enormous influence in so-called lay hypnotists being able to, to turn hypnotherapy into a career. And I'm one of those people, you know, and, and I would rather take a person who has one week of hypnosis training over the average psychologist any day of the week. I'm serious about that. Because I, I spent 25 years now working with clients. And even though there's a lot of good psychologists in the world and there, there's a lot of useful stuff, when I speak to clients on a daily basis and ask them, how did your psychologist try to help you? For the vast majority of them, the story is that they've been basically telling their story and the psychologist has kind of been empathetic and listening and that's about it. That's how a lot of these people work practically, despite the research suggesting that that doesn't really do much good. So, so even a hypnotist with, with a week of training is at least doing something. It's, it's more active. It's more teaching a skill. You know, and a lot of these so-called lay hypnotherapists are doing a tremendous service and a tremendous job 
for people who have not been helped by regular psychologists. At the same time, one of the big weaknesses in this is, of course, what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, people know just enough to kind of get cocky and to confuse what little they know with all there is to know. And I, I, I see a tendency, I, I, I made this point in the video I made about omnihypnosis, Jerry Kine, Steve Parkhill, just how tribal and, and close-minded many of these communities seem to get. They're talking about memory and change and psychology the same way that Dave Ellman was in the 1950s. Dave Ellman has an excuse. He lived in the 1950s. There, there, there's no reason for people who live and study today to, to do so. So a couple of final things. Dave Ellman taught, he, he did a lot of interesting stuff. He worked with people for migraines, stuttering, allergies, phobias, pain, uh, pain-free childbirth. They, they did a lot of stuff around that. And he, he would teach what he called a hypnotic coma state, which is, of course, not at all a coma state, but it's inspired of the old work of James Estale, who used to do these amputations and surgeries in India without anesthetics back in the day. Now, I've never been part of a surgery. I, I've never done that sort of work, so I, I, I can't speak from any experience. I have used Elman's uh, format, which is essentially just his induction, plus some extra relaxation suggestions, to produce what he calls the Estale or coma state in perhaps 10 people throughout my career. But again, I would argue that this is not available for most people. You need a really highly hypnotizable client to do it. Um, and finally, the whole idea of hypnosleep. Uh, Elman taught something called hypnosleep, which is both trying to you know, um, attach hypnosis to someone who's already sleeping that's one version. So going into someone's bedroom and, and saying to them something along the lines of, you know, it's, it's, it's me, whatever your name. You can hear me, but you can't wake up. You can hear me, but you can't wake up. And I know that you are listening when that right index finger begins to lift, right? And Elman claims to have helped his son and some other people and that Patients and doctors, uh, nurses have, have done this with people. Um, I just tried on my wife and, and my daughter and, and had no success whatsoever uh, in, in doing that. Um, I'm not an expert on sleep, but Elman seemed to have this idea that if, if you just knock the conscious mind completely out and attach hypnosis to sleep, that that would be the deepest form of hypnosis possible. I strongly suggest that this is probably not the case at all. He also did this other thing where he would uh, get what he would call somnambulism and uh, give someone a cue, you know, say that, okay, when you come out of the hypnosis, I'm gonna give you X cue, and when I give you this cue, you're gonna fall asleep. So that the, the, the person would then fall asleep based upon a post-hypnotic suggestion, and then uh, Elman would do exactly what I just told to kind of attempt to attach uh, a hypnotic state to sleep and to do hypnoanalysis and, or suggestion work from there. I did this with a few clients back in my uh, uh, regression days. I remember specifically one or two cases where it seemed good. It seemed to be like a pretty profound hypnosis. I don't really think they were asleep though. From what I've read from the neuroscience on hypnosis, sleep and hypnosis seem completely unrelated. And it, it, it doesn't really make sense so, but, but, but if you have had experiences with hypnosleep and where you've, uh, I mean, you'd probably have to work in the lab though to really 
to really be able to see is the person actually asleep and can you attach a hypnotic state to the sleep state and make changes i'm highly skeptical of this i i highly suspect that the notion of hypno sleep is a flawed concept and not at all real but then again you know i uh i may be wrong so these are my thoughts on dave Elman. i highly recommend reading his book hypnotherapy it's it's a great book it's one of my uh favorite hypnosis books uh interesting case stories again even if a lot of the theories are are you know wrong and the, the book is from the 1960s and it's still one of the classics it, it, it's it's one of those books that if you work in the field of hypnosis i think it's one of the books that you absolutely should have read uh there's also various tape cassette things available i have this thing called five hours of recorded hypnoanalysis here's the kind of workbook on that you know that's interesting too where you can listen to dave ellman do um, uh, do his work so if you haven't checked out dave ellman please do uh but don't stop there and if you are a student of dave ellman know that there's a lot to learn about change and psychology and hypnosis outside of that world as well so um if you have any comments on this uh if you agree disagree i'd love to hear it you know please post it uh, under the video um if you're looking for change work and you like the way i think uh know that i see clients from all over the world on skype you can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com if you're listening to this in 2022 I am doing a seminar called Painful Illusions, which is about how I work with people who have chronic pain and psychosomatic issues. It's November uh, 26th and 27th, 2022. You can find the seminar information on provocativehypnosis.com. And I'm speaking at the UK Hypnosis Conference, uh, Friday, November 11th. I hope to see some of you there. So once again, thanks for listening. Hope this was useful.